Chapter 14 is patient assessment and clinical reasoning. We're going to discuss patient assessment and how it applies to the advanced EMT level. We're going to remember that patient assessment is a constant ongoing thing that helps us identify issues with our patient. We're going to apply the scene information and patient assessment findings, the scene size up, the primary and secondary assessment, patient history and reassessment to guide emergency management. Our objectives, we want to talk about the key terms, describe the purpose and goals of patient assessment, describe the components of the patient assessment process, discuss the decisions that must be made during the patient assessment process, explain the importance of both the systematic approach and adaptability in patient assessment. EMS is all about improvising and adapting. Explain the importance of various decision-making and problem-solving approaches in the patient assessment and patient care processes. Patient assessment is the process through which problems are found by comparing findings to the expected normal state of functioning. It is a thorough process of systematically collecting relevant information. Information that's going to be important to the scene, important to the patient to find information that's going to further improve your patient care. You want to compare findings to what healthy functioning looks like. That's why it was so imperative that we go over the first chapters of this uh, course to learn about homeostasis and to learn about the normal body functioning because in order to know what's abnormal, we've got to know what is normal. As you can see here, EMS providers um, are in a unique position to observe the mechanism of injury in the patient's surroundings. Not every scene is going to be the same. Not every scene is going to be cut and dry. Let's do a patient assessment, load and go, and get out of here. Not every scene is going to be safe. And it is your duty to do your scene size up, to do make sure you have scene safety. Scene safety isn't just making sure that the bad guy is arrested. Scene safety is everything. Like in this situation here, this scene is not is possibly not safe because we've got fluid leaking from the engine compartment. We've got shards of glass. Of course, we're always going to have to be put in situations that aren't safe, but keeping an ongoing assessment of the whole situation is very important. So our purpose and goals of patient assessment include uh, the assessment base management. This is going to be information collected and analyzed during the patient assessment to make patient care decisions. You, you're going to be in a unique position. You're going to collect information about the patient's environment and mechanism of injury because you are there at the scene. That's very important when it comes to transporting the patient and dropping them off at the hospital because the nurses and the doctors were not on the scene. So what you can tell them about what you found at the scene, what the scene looked like, what were the surroundings, what were the events leading up to the patient's uh, problem, you need to have all that in your mind. And we cannot open up the specified file. The purpose and goals of patient assessment continued. You need to keep in mind, is it safe to approach the patient and begin care in the patient's current location? What is the nature of the patient's problem? And how sick is the patient? Which interventions, resources, or actions required immediately? We've already discussed in the previous chapters that there are a lot of disease processes that require immediate action, immediate resources, fluids, oxygen, to provide the best patient care and to provide the best patient outcome. And then which healthcare facility can best meet the patient's immediate needs? 
you need to always keep in mind that if you work for bigger companies or bigger cities, there may be more than just one hospital. In Lee County, we have East Alabama, so there's really not a lot of question of what hospital we, we go to unless we're out up 280 towards Columbus in Smith Station um, in that area. And then, of course, then you have, have three or four different hospitals that you can go to in Columbus Medical Center, St. Francis. Um, I don't think you can go to doctors anymore, but um, you can also go to East Alabama. But you also need to make a decision, is this patient flight worthy? Do they need to be flown somewhere? Do they meet criteria to meet the, uh, the trauma guidelines? So you need to have all the operation stuff in your mind as well. There's a lot that goes into the dynamics of a scene. Again, how should the patient be transported? What do you need to do to support the patient's vital functions from the time you arrive at the scene to the time you transfer patient care to other health care personnel? Do they need fluids? Do they need lots of fluids? Do they need an IV? Do they need medications? Do they need oxygen? Do they need a combi tube? All of these, these are all things that you've got to think of. And is the patient's condition stable? improving or worsening and think about how you're going to know if the patient is improving or worsening you've got to get your baseline assessment you've got to get your baseline vital signs you've got to get your baseline scene size up you and your partner in are in the second unit to arrive on scene for a multi-vehicle multi-patient collision after receiving a quick report from the triage officer, you begin to assess a child who is entrapped. The child's mother is outside the vehicle screaming for you to hurry. What should you keep in mind as you begin your assessment? Everything that we've just discussed. Safety. Overall safety. Now you've got other things factored in. You've got a hysterical mother who's very concerned about their child, who may be trying to get to their child. Then you also have another patient who may be that mother. The condition of the child, the condition of the vehicle that the child's in. What's going to be the most appropriate hospital for the child to go to? Should they be flown out? Are they alert? Are they breathing? You've got to keep all this stuff in mind. The systematic approach minimizes chances you will overlook an important clues to the patient's problem. You'll use preliminary information you obtain to direct the rest of your assessment. If you approach patient assessment as a system that you do the same thing every time, now you do have to adapt to scenes because not every scene presents the same way. But if you do the same things in the same order every time, or the best you can, it leaves out the chance that you'll forget something. Something very important. Efficiency is critical in patient assessment. You've got to be efficient. You've got to know your stuff. You've got to, got to, got to know your stuff. There's also many medical data points that could be collected in the field, but that would steal valuable time from patient survival. You want to focus on your patient. You want to not delay patient care. But if there's, if there's stuff that you can gather that's not delaying patient care, you need to get it. As you develop your assessment skills, you'll learn to direct your assessment based on the patient's presenting symptoms. You've already began developing your patient assessment skills through EMT. Your assessment is no different than your EMT assessment, except now you're thinking a little bit deeper. So what are the four essential components of patient assessment? You've got your scene size up. Your primary assessment, your secondary or your ongoing assessment, and your reassessment. 
they all go hand in hand. You have to have your primary assessment. You have to have your primary assessment to know if your patient has had any changes for the better or the worse. Your secondary assessment to check your baseline assessment. And then reassessment, always keep your eye on the patient. Always keep your eye on the patient's vital signs because a stable patient can go bad in a hurry. In your scene size up, you want to identify the hazards, the number of patients, and the need for additional resources. This is information that's going to help you provide better care on the scene. You've got to identify your hazards, things that are being your way, things that will um, potentially harm you and your partner, things that could potentially further harm the patient, things that can potentially harm bystanders. Number of patients. Is the patient load going to be enough for you to handle? Or are you going to be overwhelmed and do you need additional resources? Or if this patient's going to require a level of care that's beyond your scope. And we're going to determine the nature of illness and the mechanism of injury because this is going to provide valuable information as to how we treat the patient. So in the overview of a patient assessment process, you've got your scene size up, which includes all the operational aspects, but it also includes the first parts of your clinical aspects, demographics and things such as that. Then your primary assessment, are they unresponsive? Are they unresponsive and not breathing? No pulse, pulse, all these things go hand in hand. Your secondary assessment, this is for your critical medical patients, critical trauma patients, any patients in general, this is where you get more of your focused physical exam and all that. And then your primary or your reassessment is where you're going to go back and check to see if anything's changed with your primary and your secondary assessment. Your mechanism of injury or nature of illness, this is used to determine if the patient's problem is due to injury or a medical problem, or both. Did the patient crash and then have a heart attack, or did the patient have a heart attack and then crash? Your general, general impression, this is where you're going to determine the urgency of the patient. You've got a patient that's having severe chest pain and is in severe distress. Your general impression is going to be a patient who is in severe distress with chest pain, possibly having an MI. Also, whether this patient is obviously responsive or appears to be unresponsive and take the steps necessary to treat them accordingly. During the primary assessment, advanced EMTs confirm the level of responsiveness and check for and correct immediate life-threatening problems involving the airway, breathing, and circulation, ABCs. Without A, you can't do B. Without B, you can't do C. Without A, B, or C, you can't move on. You can't treat the patient further because if they are not breathing, then there's really no reason to treat anything else. You've got to correct the airway and breathing and circulation. During our primary assessment, we're going to add one more letter into the mnemonic, D. So what does ABCD stand for? It stands for airway, breathing, circulation, and disability. This means neurologic disability assessed by the level of responsiveness. Their ability to respond to the environment, their mental status, the clarity of thinking, their appropriate behavior, what kind of a response do they have? Is it a painful response? Is it a, a verbal response? This is where your AVPU is going to come in. This is where you're going to check are they responsive? Are they alert and responsive? Are they responsive to verbal commands? Painful and noxious stimuli? Or are they unresponsive? Your airway, breathing, and circulation, you want to identify your 
immediate life threats. Are they breathing? Is their airway patent? Absence of breathing and circulation is the highest priority. Obstructive airway or inadequate breathing must be managed immediately. You've got to get that airway going. If your patient is obviously unresponsive, you want to check for carotid pulse for no more than 10 seconds. Remember, we don't check radial pulse in unresponsive patients, we check carotid pulse. Then, if there's a pulse absent, you want to begin CPR by starting chest compressions. And then, if the pulse is present, then you need to check the patient's airway, breathing, and circulation. If they're unresponsive with a pulse, or they respond to pain or voice, or they're responsive, you want to always assess the airway, make sure that it's patent and that you have good ventilation, effect, assess the effectiveness of breathing. If it's ineffective, then it must be corrected before moving on, and then assess the effectiveness of circulation and control external hemorrhaging. And again, circulation isn't just checking the pulse, it's checking your skin color and temp, your capillary refill, and any obvious life-threatening bleeding. Immediate CPR. Begin CPR immediately if they do not have a pulse. CAB puts ABC backwards. In this case, if they're pulseless, you need to start your circulation. You need to begin CPR, but you do not need to withhold breathing in the airway as well. And then you need to control hemorrhage, uncontrolled hemorrhage. We're not worried about a little laceration that's trickling blood on their hand or something like that. We're talking about severe hemorrhage. Your primary assessment establishes priorities for treatment and transportation. You must balance the need for treatment on the scene with the need for transport without delay. You need to be able to differentiate between critical and non-critical patients. A patient on the scene may think that they're critical, but you're assessment skills will be able to make that true determination. Critical patients are those who need or are on the verge of needing emergent interventions. You've got to plan for the future. You've got to plan for what's next. If they look like they're about to stop breathing, they probably are about to stop breathing. If they're having severe chest pain that's hindering their ability to breathe, they're probably about to start having an MI. You need to plan. You need to identify cardiac chest pain and what could come along with it, signs and symptoms of stroke, and then if it's a significant mechanism of injury, if they've been ejected from a vehicle or if they've had a fall that's from a high altitude, or if they've had a gunshot or anything like that, anything that's significant. Non-critical patients they still need to be evaluated and treated at the hospital, but usually these are not patients that require immediate intervention. However, non-critical patients can turn to critical patients if they are not treated accordingly. But these are your patients who are alert and talking, alert and oriented, they're breathing okay, they've got good strong pulses, and there's no life-threatening medical conditions or mechanisms of injury. You want to do a rapid trauma exam on critical trauma patients. Um, and you need to do this before packaging your patient. And this is just a quick hitting the high points and making sure that there's nothing life threatening. Your secondary assessment, this is where you get your medical history and your baseline vital signs. And you conduct your physical exam. This is going to be a more detailed exam. Again, you must, must, must Measure your pace on vital signs. The approach will vary in your secondary assessment whether the problem is medical or traumatic and whether the patient is non-critical or critical. 
In your physical exam, you're going to do rapid physical exam, whether it's trauma or medical, and a focused physical exam, and a head-to-toe exam. Your rapid physical exam, this is uh, where you quickly check the head, the neck, the torso, your extremities, your abdominal area, and all that for any conditions not found in the primary assessment. Your focused physical exam, you start on your secondary assessment and you get your medical history. Then you can you can have more time to look over all the areas that might have been missed or any non-obvious uh, problems. This is where you focus on the patient's chief complaint. If they're complaining of chest pain, you focus on that chest pain. But remember that chest pain and the cardiac system can have components of the respiratory system and a lot of other areas too. So. Always keep in mind that you may need to adjust, adjust and adapt on your focused uh, physical exam. For an unresponsive medical patient, you need to perform a rapid physical exam to detect any serious problems that are not found in a primary assessment. Your secondary assessment of a trauma patient depends on the severity of the patient's condition, how severe the mechanism of injury was, and how severe the injury is. And again, you want to go back and assess your ABCs and the disability, and then you want to expose. You need to cut them clothes off if it's a bad trauma. You need to remember to protect your patient's dignity, but you need to also be able to perform a good exam. And the reassessment is your ongoing assessment to continue to make observations about the patient while preparing for transport and initiating treatment. On your critically ill or injured patient, you want to reassess every 5 minutes or sooner. And then on your non-critical patient, you want to reassess every 15 minutes. So going back, what are your four major components of the patient assessment? Your scene size up, your primary, your secondary assessments, and your reassessment. You need to have clinical reasoning and problem solving. You need to be able to think out of the box. You need to be able to have critical thinking. And it starts with your knowledge based on facts and principles. And then your patient assessment experience skills. You need to be able to collect information, analyze that information. Form your field impression. Be able to manage that patient. And then go back and collect more information if you need to. And then over time, you'll learn different processes for problem solving and critical thinking. But in order to have a baseline for problem solving, you need to have a knowledge base of the sciences, of the physiology and the pathophysiology of the body, the anatomy of the body. You also need to have a hypothetical deductive approach, critical thinking approach. These are questions you need to ask yourself when you're doing a patient assessment. You need to be able to recognize patterns, patterns that are based on similarity to previous encountered problems. And remember rules of thumb, the most common cause of collection of signs and symptoms is more likely the conclusion than the uncommon cause. Always Think about your simplest problems first. If your simplest problems can be managed by the information that you've collected, treat those. If they still cannot be managed, then you need to start thinking for more uncommon causes. Your pitfalls for clinical reasoning and judgment. Search satisf uh, satisficing. Fundamental attribution error. Uh, commission bias and anchoring. Search satisficing can also be called tunnel vision. This is where you just 
focus on the patient's major complaint and not think about something else that may be going wrong with the patient. Imagine you had a patient that fell from the roof. He's complaining of right pain, right arm pain, and you notice that he's got an obvious deformity in his right arm. This is where you just focus on that right arm and you don't focus on any more of the assessment that's required for this patient. This patient may have other injuries as well. He may have back injuries or, or internal bleeding, but you, you've stopped at just the obvious. You, you don't need to stop at just the obvious and be satisfied with just taking care of that one injury. Fundamental attribution error. This occurs when you wrongly attribute a person's behavior to his personality or disposition rather than to the circumstances. Oh, that's just the way that Mr. Joe always acts. He's acting funny, but we know that's the way he acts. Well, Mr. Joe might be having a stroke, and so we, we need to, um, again, do a full assessment and not just at, uh, attribute the way he's acting to his personality. A big error in EMS is called mission bias. This means that EMS providers can sometimes have a hard time not initiating treatment. It is difficult to realize that sometimes the less one does, the better. Providers often have a tendency to over-treat patients because it makes them feel better to do something for a patient. Remember, there must be a clear indication for any test or treatment that is provided for the patient. You must be able to defend every treatment and every test that you do on a medical ground. You don't want to just give a med because it felt like the right thing to do. You want to give a med because that's what you need to do. That's what the assessment calls for. And then anchoring is when a piece of information revealed early in the assessment process is seized upon and made to be more significant than it really is. It is essentially an error made by jumping to conclusions. To avoid these pitfalls, reflect on your thinking processes, share your thought processes, get feedback on your patient's outcomes, and then always keep up to date with continuing medical advancements and different studies. And then how is your thinking about case study change from the beginning of this chapter? There are many components of assessment, treatment, and preparation for transportation. These must all occur simultaneously. You need to know each component well and we'll discuss more in detail on each one of these components in the future chapters. Teamwork. There's no I in team. You need to work together with the other people who are part of your team. Always prioritize scene safety for your team so that your team can successfully treat that patient. Airway management management of ventilation and oxygenation and maintaining the patient circulation. ABC Chapter 15, we're going to talk about scene size up and primary assessment, and we're going to go deeper into the scene size up and the primary assessment so that you can have a more successful scene and a more manageable scene. We're going to apply scene information and patient assessment findings, which include the things you see here, to guide emergency management. Our objectives continued. The two phases of the patient assessment provide initial information, your scene size up and your primary assessment. These are to build the mental framework for patient assessment. It will provide you with a wealth of information provided that you have the information and you collect it in a meaningful way. They are not just checklists to be completed mindlessly by rote. They are deliberate processes for collecting information that informs decisions about further assessment and treatment. Your scene size up has several different aspects. You've got your operational and your clinical aspects. Operational, you want to look for indications of scene safety. You want to look at what is posing a risk right now, what's an immediate risk, what could pose a risk, anything that's going to provide an unsafe environment for you and your partner and ultimately your patient. The general nature of the incident, 
all your operational decisions are you going to need help how are you going to transport where do you need to put your ambulance and then your clinicals is is also um, going to be your patient in general your assessment of your patient primary assessment is about collecting and acting on information about immediate threats to your patient also immediate threats to yourself as well these are all gained through all your senses sight hearing smell touch if it doesn't smell right if, it, if something doesn't look right, if, if you hear awkward or weird noises that sound dangerous, or even if, if you know, it, it, it's slippery or, or it's hot, or whatever it may be, if something's not right, you need to do what you can to fix it. It's a complete rapid analysis. It's a quick scan of identifying anything that could be uh, potentially dangerous. When you first arrive, you want to observe the scene and determine your mechanism of injury. And also, you want to see what kind of threats there are. There are many threats that are on this scene with the car, glass, shards of metal, could be leakage, could be fire, could be environmental issues, could be patient issues. You need to identify all of them. You start collecting information before making initial contact with a patient. Patient care begin begins before you even talk to the patient. The scene size up informs you about decisions that you may need to make for additional resources, what personal protective equipment, and of course your standard precautions as well. You want to determine your mechanism of injury or nature of illness. This refers to the types and amounts of energy a patient was subjected to and what caused the harm from this energy. Your five types of energy are going to include the energy of objects in motion, which is your kinetic energy your heat or thermal energy, electricity, radiation, and chemical injury, or chemical injury, energy. Kinetic energy can produce blunt or penetrating injuries. Impact with an object that has a high surface area and relatively low velocity does not penetrate the body. And this is called blunt force injury. Examples would be hits with baseball bats or, or blunt objects. And this can result into open injuries when the force is great enough. And again we see it here. Penetrating trauma the surface area is small. A low velocity impact results in penetration. This usually includes a, a sharp object. However, even though the, the, the area is small, you could still be suffering major consequences from penetrating trauma. Here are some critical mechanisms of injury. Ejection from a vehicle. Motor vehicle collision that causes death to another occupant. Even if, even if the patient is fine right now, if, if it was strong enough to cause the death of a passenger, or a driver, then they need to be evaluated. Rollovers, high speed, intrusion of greater than 12 inches into the passenger compartment of a vehicle, or crush of greater than 18 inches at any point on the vehicle. Pedestrian or bicyclist struck by a motor vehicle. Motorcyclists involved in collision at greater than 20 miles per hour. Falls from greater than a height of 20 feet. Blast trauma, penetrating trauma, amputation or near amputation, and trauma and burns. And these are just a few. There's tons of mechanisms of injury that can be significant. 
when the mechanism of injury is consistent with the possibility of a C-spine injury, you want to provide manual inline stabilization, even if the patient isn't complaining of neck pain. Neck pain. If it's a, a severe enough mechanism of injury, you want to stabilize that neck. You got to hold manual stabilization until the patient is fully immobilized to a long backboard with a uh, cervical collar in place. Assessment of the mechanism of injury determines if inline manual stabilization of cervical spine is uh, needed. For a conscious patient, you want to place the hands on the head to prevent him from moving his head and neck. For unresponsive, check your pulse. If the pulse is present, open the airway with modified jaw thrust maneuver. If the pulse is not present, then you're probably going to have to start a trauma arrest guidelines. And again, here's some of your indications of cervical spine injury. And a lot of them go hand in hand with uh, the significant mechanisms of injury that we just talked about. Your general impression is indication of how to approach your primary assessment. Don't assume. Look for clues about the scene in the patient. Don't assume that the scene is safe. You've got to look. Listen for sounds. Detect odors. Use your sense of touch. You're going to formulate a general impression of the patient's status to guide your primary assessment. Be cautious but confident. Maintain order. If you're the highest trained level of care on the scene, you're in charge. And even if you're not, you still need to maintain composure with yourself in order that you can help other people remain um, composed. A provider freaking out is not going to help a patient freaking out. You've got to be composed. Your scene size up will provide information about your nature of illness and or your mechanism of injury. They're not complete at the beginning of the call. It continues until you leave the scene. Your primary con assessment continues until you turn over patient care to another health care provider, which you can't turn over care to another health care provider if they're of lower licensure than you. It's either got to be equal or higher level of care. Purpose of your primary assessment is to immediately identify and correct conditions that can cause patients death if not remedied at once. These are conditions that interfere with perfusion, conditions that interfere with your airway, breathing, circulation, and disability. And again, disability refers to a neurological disability. Are they responsive, unresponsive? Is there any reason why they can't fully comprehend or fully um, tell you what's going on? Patients who appear to be unresponsive and not breathing or breathing ineffectively, you always need to check the carotid pulse before opening the airway. You need to check your pulse. In this order, it's circulation, airway, and breathing. Because if they have no pulse, they need to start having resuscitation attempts. Your equipment to perform your primary assessment, of course, is going to be your personal protective equipment your portable suction unit, and your simple airway adjuncts. Why? It's because your primary assessment involves your airway and, and your suction unit and your airway adjuncts are going to help you with your airway. Also, you want to have your additional airway devices that are in your scope of practice. In your case, it's going to be your blind insertion devices, your um, combi tubes and your LMAs. Also, a bag valve mask or a pocket face mask, and you want to have your O2 readily available as well. Ways to get oxygen to the patient. Your AED. Your shears so that you can expose the patient if you need to to identify life threats. Your dressings and bandages to identify life threats. And your tourniquet if there's bleeding that you're not able to control. Here's just some things that you may see um, in your primary assessment. This is cyanosis. 
Cyanosis most often presents in the lips and the nail beds and around the mouth, but it also can be in the uh, conjunctiva of the eye too. In your primary assess assessment, you're going to determine your ge uh, general appearance, the age and the sex of the patient, responsive or unresponsive, their skin color, which is part of your circulation, and their level of distress. Are they, are they very distressed? Do they need immediate attention? Your AVPU is used to assess a level of responsiveness. This is a very handy tool in, in assessing level of responsiveness. And it includes A, which is are they alert? V, which is responsive to verbal stimulus. P, which is responsive to painful stimulus. And U, which is unresponsive to all. You also use your Glasgow Coma Scale, more of a specific way of assessing a level of responsiveness as well. A patient can be alert, but still not oriented. So you want to make sure that you know that. Patients whose eyes are open and aware of their environment, they're alert. And again, they can be open and aware to their environment, but they may not be able to answer your questions appropriately. They may not be oriented. If a patient reacts to your voice by opening his eyes, he is responsive to verbal stimulus. This indicates that he hears what is said um, to you. If the patient does not respond, check for response to painful stimulus. What are the three ways to check for response to painful stimulus? You can do nail bed. You can do pain to um, the sternum. Or a pinch to the trapezius muscle. The patient is unresponsive if he does not respond to painful stimuli. The Glasgow Coma Score is determined for every patient. All information needed to determine the Glasgow Coma Score is available from your AVPU assessment. Your mental status beyond level of responsiveness includes assessment of higher cognitive functions. And here is your Glasgow Coma Score. A patient can never get a score less than 3, and their highest score is going to be 15. And you take your best eye-opening response, add it to your best verbal response, and add it to your best motor response. So if a patient has their eyes open on the scene spontaneously, there are 4. If they're oriented and they converse to you, there are 5. And if they obey your verbal commands, there are six, which gives you a Glasgow Coma score of 15. If there's no response in any three of these categories, there are three. Decreased dis responsiveness is an indication that the brain is deprived of oxygen, circulation, or glucose, and there, or there is injury to the brain. Of course, you can have other causes, which is drug overdose, toxic exposure, environmental extremes, infection, integrant or meta uh, metabolic derangements as well. Do not delay inserting an appropriate airway, performing ventilation and transporting a patient. Airway, airway, airway. On your responsive patients, you want to determine your chief complaint. Observe for evidence that airway, breathing or circulation is compromised. And then some chief complaints make patients a higher priority for transport. What would some of these be? Chest pain, shortness of breath, things like that. And again, here's some of your high priority uh, chief complaints that require immediate transport. For unresponsive patients who are not breathing normally, primary assessment changes to CAB circulation, airway, and breathing, and that's because you've got to start your compressions. If the patient's pulse is absent, begin resuscitation, begin CPR. Unresponsive patients who have a pulse, proceed to assess in the airway because you may need to perform rescue breathing. The airway must be patent because without an open airway, the patient's life is in immediate jeopardy from hypoxia. 
You need to immediately correct any condition that partially or completely obstructs the airway. And any patient who has decreased level of responsiveness is at risk of airway obstruction. Relaxation of the muscles are the most common cause of airway obstruction. What muscles would this include? It would include the tongue and the muscles of the, the throat. The tongue falling back with no tone is one of your primary obstructions. Also, now gag reflex. This um, increases um, your risk for aspiration and then also increase for vomiting, risk for vomiting as well. In stroke patients, they have an impaired ability to swallow and they're at a big risk for aspiration. Snoring, strider, gurgling, coughing, all these breath sounds or all these um, adventitious sounds indicate partial upper airway obstruction. Again, you want to assess the airway by looking for chest rise and fall, listening for air movement at the mouth and nose, and feeling for air movement from the mouth and nose. Look, listen, and feel. You want to be, um, manually position airways for patients with decreased levels of responsiveness, and look for rise and fall of patient's chest, and listen for air movement from the mouth and nose. Air movement confirms the airway is open. If inadequate air movement, you want to begin using your BVM device. Check that you have positioned the head and neck properly to open the airway and attempt to ventilate. If you're not able to ventilate and you meet a resistance, you want to manage the patient for an obstructed airway. Level of responsiveness, skin color and temp, level of distress, Sounds such as wheezing and crackles are all indications of your breathing status. Respiratory distress, failure, and arrest need immediate intervention. And again, here are signs of inadequate breathing. Increased work of breathing, use of accessory muscles. Noisy breathing, decreased or absent air movement of breath sounds. Apnea. Respiratory arrest, a ventilatory rate of less than 8 or greater than 30 in an adult, irregular breathing, and cyanosis. Again, you note your cyanosis around the patient's mouth. You may have nasal flaring, unequal or inadequate chest expansion. They're not getting the amount of tidal volume they need to have a good uh, ventilation perfusion match. Sternocleidomastoid muscle use, abdominal muscle use, diaphragmatic muscle use, retractions of the intercostal and subclavicular uh, and suprasternal muscles, increased effort to breathe, irregular breathing rhythm, cool clammy skin, and occasional gasping breaths may be seen just before respiratory or cardiac arrest. That is not good. Normal breathing is effortless and quiet. Patients who must work to breathe are suffering from some sort of respiratory distress. The difference in respiratory distress and respiratory arrest. Respiratory arrest is the absence of breathing. Respiratory distress can very easily lead to respiratory arrest. And again, you want to assess the things seen here. You need to decide what kind of oxygen they will need. Will they need a normal breather mask or nasal cannula? Or they may need assistance with ventilation, which will include the adjuncts that you will learn about. Here's your indications for administration of oxygen. Very important, SpO2 less than 95%. We want to keep SpO2 above 95%. There's also continuous positive airway pressure devices, CPAP, that you can use that helps provide pressure on inspiration and expiration. This helps with your um, peak pressures and it helps keep your um, lungs open.
When you assess circulation, if a patient who is alert has good skin color and no significant ongoing bleeding, has adequate circulation. Unresponsive patients, you need to check the carotid pulse. And good perfusion is indicated by dry, warm skin without pallor or paleness. And again, this is why it's important to know what is normal so that you can indicate what is abnormal in your patient. Use direct pressure to control bleeding. Or you may have to apply a tourniquet if you're not able to um, control bleeding proximal to the knee or elbow. Search for and control significant external bleeding with direct pressure. And again, use your tourniquet if you need to according to your protocol. And add into your mnemonic like we've discussed earlier. E is expose your patients with significant trauma to check for bleeding to make sure you don't miss any injury. During your primary assessment, you may have to make some very important patient care decisions. If the patient is deceased and is not a candidate for resuscitation because of the presumptive signs of death that are discussed in the earlier chapters, or there's a presence of a DNR order, or if the patient is not critical but, men, but needs additional assessment and treatment. Something that's very important of a DNR order is, is that the family's wishes will trump that DNR order. If the patient has a signed DNR, a do not resuscitate, but the family says we want you to do everything you can and the patient isn't already deceased with the presumptive signs of death, you must work this patient. But to guide you further with that, Contact your medical direction. A review of the signs of presumptive signs of death. Decapitation or midsection transection of the body. The body is cut in half. Decomposition. Dependent lividity. This is discoloration of the body as the blood pulls from the effects of gravity. Gravity pulls all the blood down to the lowest points of the body. Severe charring of the body where the body has been burned. And rigor mortis, this is where the muscles are very rigid. If the patient is critical but immediate intervention may improve the situation, don't delay treatment. If the patient is critical and must be packaged and transported without delay, don't delay treatment. your high priority findings here that are going to indicate a treatment that should not be delayed you cannot overlook any part of the scene size up at primary assessment you want to perform the scene size up in this picture here there may not be a whole lot of scene safety issues but we can't see beyond this we want to look in the whole scene not just what's going on right here and again your primary assessment doesn't begin right as you're talking to the patient it begins long before that and it doesn't end until you transfer care of the patient Thank you for giving me oxygen. I could not breathe. You're welcome, ma'am. I'm here to save you. Are you feeling better? I'm going to check your pulse. I'm a responsive patient with a pulse. Open the airway. Be ready to suction, be ready to provide adjuncts if needed. Here we see that they've provided an adjunct. This patient also has signs that he has uh, vomited, which is a huge risk for aspiration. We're bagging. Check the rate and quality of the pulse and the carotid arteries and then control any obvious signs of hemorrhage. 
So again, your key phases of assessment, your scene size up, your primary assessment, your secondary assessment, and your reassessment. Reassessment and documentation. Primary assessment findings can change. You need to reassess. A critical patient can become stable and a stable patient can become critical. Always reassess general appearance, level of responsiveness, and your ABCs. Then document what you found in the beginning, what interventions you did, and the effects of the intervention. Document your primary assessment all the way through your reassessment. Scene size up and primary assessment are performed on every patient. You need to determine your mechanism of injury or nature of illness. Form your general impression. Are they responsive or unresponsive? Their skin color. Patients must have an open airway, be adequately ventilated, have adequate circulation before other assessments or interventions are even started. Assess the level of responsiveness to determine your AVPU. If the patient is unresponsive, immediately check the carotid pulse. If pulseless, begin chest compressions. If the pulse is present, proceed with assessing your airway and breathing. Know how to identify problems with airway, breathing, and circulation, and how to help correct them. And then if it's a responsive patient, obtain your chief complaint. Decrease level of responsiveness. Ensure your airway is open. Assess ad adequacy of patient's breathing. And then use your bag valve mask with supplemental oxygen and your other adjuncts to help with breathing. Check for significant external bleeding. If necessary, use a tourniquet and expose your patient if you need to. Determine your priority of transportation. Reassess your primary assessment findings. And finally, document initial and subsequent assessment findings.